Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the first pencil with Kathy and Mike. My name is Mike the Car Guy. As always, the best in the biz, my best bud all around, and friend to horses everywhere. Kathy Cruz. Kathy, how are you today? Doing great. Doing great. And your yes, your name is Mike the Car Guy. And um, does it say that on your birth certificate? No. Probably need to get it changed. <laughs> Should I have it legally changed? <laughs> There has been a lot of people popping up over the last uh, 18 months to two years, you know, Joe, the car guy, Ivan, the yeah. car, guy, car guy, and that's okay. There's room for, for all of us car guys. When yeah. You, when you think about it, that's kind of like the car business, you know, dealers are always like super concerned about the, the dealership across town, you know, like every deal they make is one that we're losing. And I've always thought there's enough business out there for us all. Let's just focus on the business that we're trying to grow. Don't worry about Joe or, you know, ABC Motors or the guys across. Let's just build our business. If we've dominated our PMA and there's no more people left in our zip codes that need to buy our product, then we can start thinking about the guy across town. Yeah, agree. I'm not worried about Eric the car guy or Ivan the car guy or any of the brand ambassadors that are out there. <laughs> <laughs> Because if we ever had a, a challenge, if everybody, if anybody ever said, "Hey, Mike, um, you know, you can't use the term Mike the Car Guy anymore," because I'm Ivan the Car Guy and I have more followers than you, I can, I can find documentation online back to 2010 yeah. when I was calling myself Mike the Car Guy. So, yeah. <laughs> and P.S. If 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 it's any kind of the Car Guy and they have thousands and thousands of followers, that. That would be suspect for me. Um, yeah, uh, if you've just, and if you wanna know the first way to find <laughs> out, <laughs> cause you don't get, you don't get uh, the, uh, I don't think there's a way to get the actual places where the, the likes come from or the followers come from. But if you look at their posts, Let's say they have, you know, I don't know, 50,000 followers on Instagram. Let's say that. And if you look at their posts and maybe, you know, maybe a hundred people liked it and maybe there's maybe three, four, five or 10 or 12 comments, or maybe even that tells you that there's a pretty good chance that they purchased followers. It's a big business. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't mean to say that it's just, you know, two, one or two people, it's a big, big business. There's huge groups, Facebook groups actually, that have, and groups elsewhere, Discord and other places, but where you just go in and put your name in and then so the thousands of the people in that, they follow you, you follow them and the people, they pay money to do it, but yeah. And there's a place for that. You know, we'll file that under Cart Rose, that whole mentality of becoming a celebrity, not building a career. And yeah. you just expose that against a guy like, again, I, I don't think we can make it through a single freaking episode without mentioning Tim Barth, but it's just because he's worth mentioning. Well, his are real, at, right? When you look at Tim, right? Yeah. You see 80,000 followers, but you look at his videos, you'll see just dozens and dozens of questions, comments, yeah. interactions. People will ask him, hey, I'm considering ordering the 2024 Mustang Dark mm -hmm. Horse package. Can I get it with this? And, you know, he'll do his research. He'll come back with an answer. So when you look at that and you look into the comments, you know, this guy's legit. He is, he's, he's, you know, building a career. He's actually serving people. And then again, you go and you look at some of these other profiles. And like you said, you look through some of their videos and, you know, the comments are wicked car, bro, or, you know, <laughs> sweet ride. It, it's, it's just, painfully obvious the difference between you know what people are trying to grow as far as are you building a business or are you just trying to achieve celebrity well yeah and that wasn't even talking about the bots that you can buy because you can buy those too and and make yourself look good yeah the, i don't think there's any place for that i just don't if you want to look good that's fine but what happens when somebody finds out that they're fake <laughs> i just don't i don't uh like i would never buy likes or followers ever i don't think no anyone should it's so it's a stupid like why would you i guess if you want to be you want to have some vanity metric and you want to be like somebody like famous or whatever i don't still, instagram famous yeah instagram famous but that doesn't pay the bills 
that's never going to pay the bills. So I just feel like you should be more truthful about your <laughs> about yourself. It's better to have a hundred followers that follow you that are cool and you interact with than you know a bunch of thousands of bots and fake people that are never going to interact. But never going to stop it. I think it's just going to go on for the dawn of time. I just, but I think the general you know, user, social user needs to be more, way more, I don't know, savvy about what you, it's getting so you can't believe anything really, but <laughs> hopefully people are getting smarter about it. Yep. What's going on with you? We talked last week, uh, actually, first, before I say that, let me apologize to anyone that, that does listen in weekly and, and believe it or not, we've got a, a group of folks that I know that you get feedback. I've gotten some feedback just this morning. A, a friend reached out and and said, uh, "Hey, missed you last week. <laughs> um, the last week was on me. I, I do have a day job. Um, I work with a, an automotive software company, and it required me being on site with some dealerships. So I was not able to to set aside time for our episode. So I do apologize, and I do sincerely appreciate folks that pay attention enough to notice that we didn't have an episode last week. So that was actually it was kind of bittersweet it was like oh shit I, I missed out you know I, that that sucks but it was cool that people are paying attention enough to know that we didn't have one so um the week before that though we kind of got into a little bit of some of your experiences with Facebook ads and I'm getting the feeling that it hasn't gotten any better for you no it hasn't and just to speak to last week uh I was thinking too during this time um and like when I texted you yesterday, like, were you ready to record today? Because I I thought you were, but I just want to make sure. I could probably do it myself because I've got enough pent up, <laughs> not not angst, but, uh, uh, you know, I need to uh, purge maybe some things. And uh, no, but I do have, you know, things I could talk about if I ever have to, if either of us have to do it. And I also should commit to that. That would be a, a nice twist too. Yeah. And also if that led to like, I could have someone um, guest uh, host, like, you know, like this is, I know you guys know, I listened to the Pivot podcast with, with Kara Swisher and, and Scott Galloway and Scott uh, always goes on what they call Scott free August. He goes just, he vacations like the Italians, they take August off. And so she has guest people on and uh that would be an interesting, interesting. exploration. Yeah. So I'm done. I'm done. that'd be cool. So that's something to think about. I started thinking about it today. I'm like, or yesterday, really, because I wasn't sure if you were done with that project or not. So anyway, not yeah, not to ignore people, but I think now that we've got, you know, a few episodes under our belt, probably we'll just try our best to do it weekly. Um, uh, but yes, it's been two weeks of of living friggin' hell with Facebook and uh Meta and uh, it's, I just, I, I don't even know. I don't even know what to say. It's, it's just the opposite of what you would do if you're a business that wants to stay in business and make money. Um, I was running just very small ads on Hanalee's fundraiser. Okay. We're still our August fundraiser and, uh, keep in mind before I go any further that, uh, <laughs> the, point in thing in all of to me social media is to entertain and share content about your business or yourself uh but never count on that to bring you leads or to do what you need it to do uh focus on getting people on your email list focus on an email list especially if you're an individual get an email list you can sign up for mailchimp it's free and, or there's others out there, but, and just get an email list going so that you get the people that want to hear from you somewhere else besides social, because you're, it's getting so bad that people don't see any of your content and it's just, you've got to do something. So that's kind of what I decided, uh, I want to say maybe right. they have, they have all conservative, conservatively moved it to requiring you to pay and pay a lot to increase the visibility of your yes. message. It used yeah. to be. You could, you know, entertain, inform, and educate, and people would just be drawn to you, and they'd grow. And you know, when someone liked a post that your business put, that means people that are in their sphere of influence would see that post, and they may say, "Oh, I like this this agency that's, you know, in entertaining or informative," and and you would grow. And now, those days are gone. You got to pay and pay big, and 
be willing to let them determine your destiny, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, but anyway, so that was what I decided to do about two years ago now or so, maybe a little less than that, but just uh, focus on getting people on our email list. Uh, and so our fundraiser has been going very well. And um, whereas a good 50% of uh, the funds raised used to be coming from Facebook and Instagram, uh, very little, we're, we're getting more smaller, uh, the, the number of them, we get still the smaller, the $20, the $10 donation. Uh, but, but for the most part, the bulk of the donations come from our email list. When I run an email campaign, we run, uh, we have a e newsletter that comes out every Wednesday. So, um, so just let me say that first. All right. So, but, um, one of the things I used to do was post, and then I would just take that post and make an ad out of it. And so I did that. And this is a, two weeks ago now. And so then it'll get approved. It usually takes, they say 24 hours, but that particular time it only took about an hour so i'm like great awesome because my experience in the previous fundraiser four months ago i do three fundraisers a year so in the previous one the one in spring they had rejected my ad for unacceptable business practices and i'm like we're a nonprofit horse rescue what the fuck are you talking about so i was very happy to see that it was approved and so i just let it go and i watched it and i will only set it up when i'm first doing it i'll only set it up for a week and see what happens on the fifth day or the sixth day of the week but right before it was about to be done uh i got an an email notification that it was rejected for unacceptable business practices i'm like oh my god so you can appeal it you just basically click a button to appeal you don't get to say anything it's just click a button so that's all i can do that's what i did and it got approved but it was already done okay so used to be when you had a Facebook ad, you could just add more budget, no big deal, okay? Shouldn't be a big deal. I just wanna add more budget, more time, add another week. That's basically what you do, simple, easy. But now you can't do that. You have to start a whole new ad. It makes you think that you're doing it. It says, put more budget or something. There's some little button that says, it doesn't say more budget, but it's something, but it makes you think that you're just putting more onto the ad but you're not, you're really creating another ad. And so of course I did that and it got approved. And this time within 24 hours, they rejected it. And <laughs> I'm not well, laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing. Oh no, it's, it's, oh, it's awful. It, it's, it, it just, you, you, you will never, it, you'll, it just doesn't make sense. It's not rational. So they rejected it for unacceptable business practices and uh, I appealed it and then they rejected it again. And not only did they reject it, but they disabled my ad account. Oh my God. Yeah. And so all my peeps at Facebook are gone. My, all my peeps, all of them. Like I used to have a good 12 people that were there that could help me. Yeah, they're all gone. So I texted Andrew Street because he runs a Facebook ads uh, business down in Austin. And he said, don't get me started. <laughs> so he said, have you thought about trying chat? And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I'll try chat. Okay, so I tried chat and this person uh, trying hard, but clearly no training, uh, told me that it was because the ad image had more than 20% text on it. I said, well, no, it doesn't because it's the same graphic that I've been using back when you had the grid tool that you could test it for text. Remember that grid tool? I don't know yes. if you guys yes, ever- Yes, I do. I used it at the dealership level. Mm -hmm. It was just this I, little I, like grid over the image and you would just click where uh, wherever there was text. And then it would say if it was 20% or not. And so that image is still the image I use because it still works. And so I said, well, that's not the case. And I said, also, that's not unacceptable business practices. If it was too much text, it would be something else. And can you please explain why my ad account is disabled? Because now it wants me to verify my ad account. And I'm here to tell you, you won't let me verify it. It 
won't, it says I don't need to be verified right there, right there. Okay. So they had to escalate it. And that was, um, when was that? Maybe today's Thursday, the 17th of August. I would say it was a week ago, Monday, Tuesday. And uh, I keep getting emails from them saying they're working on it. And then they've escalated to somewhere else and it's bouncing around and it's doing all these, these things. And this chat that I was on, I did get through a chat. It took quite a bit of effort. <laughs> uh, you have to kind of game the system in order to get the chat. Uh, but I did. And I got the person and I sent them screenshots. I was actually interacting with a human. And so uh, that I didn't have a lot of hope about it because let's face it, it's Facebook, but I, it, it just made me feel a little better that there was a person. Um, now I don't use my ad account. I don't, we don't do Facebook ads for people anymore. And the only time I use it is for, for homily. And so I'm not, you know, okay, you can disable my account. I'll just create another one. And I, but I don't want to, but if you're making me, you know, so I happen to be talking to Mike Fitzpatrick and, oh, Mike Fitzpatrick, just for you guys is he was on the show few months ago he does facebook ads he's really more of a google ads person and he's got a really great tool called smart target that he created that will let you merchandise vehicles online and uh spend your budget very very efficiently uh he's it's very proprietary so uh he's in other words it's his brain that made it and it's really cool but anyway so he's he's more google but he does facebook ads and um he he's spending 20 grand a month in Facebook ads and the same exact thing happened to him. Wow. And so he's got nowhere to go. He's tried chat. He's been just exactly like what happened to me. And this is a guy, you know, your stuff when it comes to it, but this is a guy who, I mean, mm -hmm. when, you, when you talk about the, the, the space of people that are, you know, the go-to people, he's, he's someone that I would say, knows as much as any freaking person alive when yeah. it comes to marketing and Facebook. Yeah. And that's how I met him um, when I was doing some marketing stuff. I, I met him through you, actually. I mean, I followed him online, but I personally met him through you. And I've used his Smart Target um, Facebook program, and it was it was phenomenal. It was, it was amazing. I just got out of that and transitioned into a different stage. And mm -hmm. But he's still the guy I would consider mm -hmm. as awesome. And if he's getting his account shut down jesus this is one group of dealerships that he's working with <sighs> we're just one wow. group um wow. that's spending 20 grand a month and and i'm sure andrew street is spending hundreds of thousands and he said if you're not spending millions and millions you get nothing and it's just super concerning and i don't know how you run a business like that um it, it's just so not only does it not help you make profit but it also makes you look really bad <laughs> you look really bad so um yeah so i just finally just stopped and i didn't run any more ads and and uh oh well but so there's my story so at the end of the day the moral of the story is to do go use social to to connect to engage to attract people to get people to know you you or your business and then offer up be sure to offer up to get them off of social to get them into your email list get their email and give them something to do that with give them something for free some kind of you know giveaway of some sort um i was talking to mike yesterday actually um he was he's thinking about doing a, a four part email course and you sign up for his email and he'll give you just a video course uh, for poor emails and about, cause he's a master when it comes to Google, uh, it's called Looker Studio now, which I can't stand that name, but it was data. You can't even say it without giggling. <laughs> it was called I mean, data. The emotional maturity of a 14 year old. Yes, we know. But yeah. every time I think Looker Studio, <laughs> it just makes me laugh. But it's super powerful for, uh, for just knowing what's going on with your website and, and sure. tie your ads in and you can track so many awesome things and he's just a master at it. He's like, he blows me away. So he's got a lot of information uh, over and above the smart target uh, 
product. So anyway, so I just, yeah, word to the wise. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you come up with un unacceptable business practices for a nonprofit course rescue. I just don't. Um, yeah. But all it would take is literally five seconds. This is what Mike said. It would take five seconds with a human to explain what's going on. But I keep getting emails. I got another email today. We're working on it because I wrote one to him last night. Where where are we? This is taking him long. Another email back. We're working on it. Yeah, sure you are. It's crazy. <laughs> I think they're just waiting for me to give up and I probably will just because I don't, I don't have time to. Base I wonder it. how much of their attention has just been shifted off of making Facebook ads work and keeping it working and derivative to, you know, driven towards threads and making sure that that grows into something. Um, Instagram, you know, there's so many different things now. Are they just like, well, We're I know they have a team budget towards for Facebook support. We're just going to put it over to here and, I mean, I'm in threads. I know you're in threads because I they see. Have, they, no, no, Mike, they have a team for threads. I know Adam Masseri is in charge of the team and there's only about a dozen people. I, I know that from, from my network. Um, and it's a separate entity. I, I would like to give them that, you know, like they're too busy, but trust me on this. It's partially <laughs> because they hired thousands and thousands of people during COVID and now they're letting go thousands and thousands of people, which that's, that's fine because that's what you need to do. I mean, I get it. But when you gut things and then your customers want to spend money with you and they can't. You, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that's what it is. Is they just fired too many people and left uh, uh, holes in places and oh well. So that's my story. But. We hit our goal for our fundraiser, so I'm good. We did? Well, that's, there's a silver lining, at least. That's good. We actually blew right through it, so. The horses can eat. Horses can eat. That's right. Yeah. And I was looking at the uh, weather this morning, even. They said again, because I was like, I saw it yesterday. I'm like, okay, you know, hurricane. Hurricane Hillary, yeah. And But it can always, because there this used to happen all the time, Um when I remember, like over the years, you know, when there was a, a hurricane off Baja, you know, the weather here gets dicey. But, you know, then they were saying, oh, you know, hurricane's going to hit Southern California. It's like, yeah, I don't know. So, but it looks like it's going to be like get one and a half to two inches of rain. So to hit, hit the shore as a tropical storm, a pretty heavy tropical storm. And that's, again, we're, we're still days out. It won't yeah. hit us till Sunday. So anything can change. The trajectory can change. That's just an estimate, but uh, it can change both ways. <laughs> it can go out and, and we don't get much rain or it can, you know, intensify and come on shore as, yeah. as a huge storm. So who knows what's going to happen? So, and the, ran the, ranch is, the ranch isn't set up for one and a half to two inches of rain quickly. So that's the part that worries me. So sure, it's, it's a never ending, it's never ending trouble with worrying about things so <laughs> try not to <laughs> anyway so that's my story for the week yay yeah that's an intense story i've been actually um out in in showrooms and and working with uh you know shoulder to shoulder with car folks which i love to do it's it's that's the part of the business that i miss a lot you know making deals or you know being in that that mix uh i don't miss the the politics i don't miss the hours that's for sure you know it seems like as I got to know some of these folks, they're like, why did you get out of the car business? And my first impulse was like, I don't know, this is fun. I freaking love this. <laughs> but, you know, I'm like, my 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 youngest, my, my son was starting his first year of high school and he wanted to play football. And I had just gotten over missing out on so many aspects of his life that I said, F it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something that allows me to be there for him and enjoy life. And you know we've we've been making it so far but there was a lot of a lot of that adrenaline a lot of that fun you know it was it was there i i'm not saying that i don't miss the the car business at least the showroom side of it and even you know when i was out back working with the technicians that there, there's so many great people that that keep our industry alive you know yes there are a lot of jerks in the business don't get me started on you know how many idiots are in the wrong chairs and have influence and ability to 
control people's livelihoods, but there's a lot of good people working really hard out there. I mean, across across the country, you know, when you look at the impact that the automotive industry has on our nation, on our economy, on everything, you know, I've, I've really always said that beyond selling cars and driving tax revenue for your community, dealers across this country support Little League teams, you know, Girl Scout troops, um, parades. There's so many other great things that are happening as a result of our business. It's, it's, it's an interesting business to be a part of, and I'm, I'm still proud to be in the automotive industry, not necessarily working in a dealership, but I'm still in it. But on the flip side, an unpopular opinion, you know, we talk as vendors, we talk about the industry having to, to provide a better experience, right? We, you know, we need to make buying a car easier for customers, less hassle, less, you know, drama, less time, right? More efficient. But on the flip side of that, there's always two stories, right? There are still customers out there that are just freaking idiots. <laughs> I'm just going to say it's not popular. I know someone's going to write in and say, oh, that's that's not the right thing to say. But, you know, I did see quite a few people that were, you know, and I've said for a long time, normally. Wait, wait back up because I'm, I'm missing. Where did you see these people? In showrooms at the dealerships I was working when with. you're. Okay, got it. Over this last few days, people, okay. you know, being on the showroom, I was in earshot. I was listening to what they were saying. I was privy. It wasn't just an opinion based off of input from a salesperson or a sales manager. I was listening to them and I was like, oh my God, some things never change, you know? Normal, good, decent people that, that you know, attend service on Sunday and will, you know, hand a homeless guy a dollar, right? When they see him, that have values and beliefs will completely sometimes suspend all that when they cross the threshold of a car dealership and they'll become lying conniving horrible people because they believe well these car dealers are trying to screw us over so That's whatever right. i say to them That's it's okay exactly it. they'll, it's they'll tell their wife okay. look honey don't don't pay attention to everything i'm going to say because these guys are trying to pull it over on us so if we don't protect ourselves so i'm going to lie i'm going to cheat i'm going to steal but in the end of the day we're going to get ourselves a good deal and mm -hmm. and they do sometimes they just make up stuff that you're like really <laughs> so it, it it was funny to see that you know sometimes the more things change the more some things stay the same the car business hasn't changed since i stepped out of the showroom and it's not gonna it really isn't no i think it's worse honestly that that whole experience that i i'm not saying that all of the all the customers tell the truth because there's a lot that don't but there is an advert when you're going in to fight and the perception is it's adversarial if you're going to go into a showroom i will never go into a show okay i don't know you know that's just not how i i operate but i know that people do do that they have to do that and uh when i was just talking to a friend that did it herself and she i, t I said why did you i don't understand why you don't call me what 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 did you do this for it's just not worth the brain damage. So anyway, yeah, it's an, and so people put their armor up and then they say things or do things and be a different person because it's an adversarial situation. Um, I just believe that if it's not adversarial uh, and if there's, there's steps taken to uh, help the customer not feel it's adversarial, then it's going to be a much better experience for everybody. Sure. But that comes with training and, and management and leadership. And that is, I'm not seeing that. I'm, I mean, if that were to happen, like I said in my newsletter just this week, because I had to talk about this customer experience and that if you were to do that, you would, you would be just so, be so memorable that because nobody's doing it and that's, it's all about you know being different than to make people remember you so uh no need and why is it, it doesn't need to be adversarial but yes yeah, sure there's people that have you know if you're i i spent a lot of time at highline so we didn't see a lot of this type of customer but i've worked at my share of you know nissan store Ford's, um toyota honda and you have people that have you know they're just they need cars but they're you know they're not they don't have great credit and they're not you know Let's say they're not a, uh, they're not like a, you know, um, a business person or a, uh, 
you know, there, in, in my experience, there's two types of bad credit. There are people that, you know, have had some challenges and, you know, got overwhelmed by it mm -hmm. and are trying to do the right thing. And there are people that there's a reason their 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 score yeah. is a 490. They're just yeah. lifelong, you know, that type of person. And there's 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 ways to approach the business. Both businesses are worth having. You know, there's no business yes. that that isn't worth it. It's just is it worth it to you? You know, there are dealerships that decide, look, we're not going to dip into the subprime because we just don't have the the department staffing for it because it requires a different approach, a different method. It re almost requires, you know, back in, in my day, we had departments that were just your special finance or subprime divisions because it, it it's a different type of sales, a different type of process. And and if dealers aren't willing to dedicate staff and budget and, and process to it, then don't, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't even try. You, you can't, you can't be everything to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, your point in that was that there are folks that are recovering from challenges in their life that you don't understand. have to okay you're being very politically correct <laughs> just say go ahead and say whatever you got to say because it's so prime is, is is a dicey place to to live it really is yeah yeah and you have to be on point and on I every single as we point. move forward with you know, right now, repossessions are at the highest they've been since they started recording these things. Interest rates are going up. Negative equity in vehicles is is growing faster than anything else. There are going to be a lot of people that we've done a good job of conditioning folks over the last 60, 70 years to want a new car every three to five years. That's what we've mm -hmm. tried to instill in them. And now people do it like birds fly south for the winter. It just happens. They just go, hey, that that's a new shiny car. And they look at their car and they think it's time to get out of it. They don't necessarily do the math two plus two until they get to the dealership. And there are people who are going to be leaving dealerships, not able to make a car deal that just say, you know what? F it. 20 grand in negative equity is just not worth it. I'm just going to stop making the payments, call the bank, come take this piece of crap and, and I'll, you know, start over again. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to see an increase in that subprime type of customer and reestablishment and i think it's gonna it's gonna be a, a tidal wave that we're not ready for and so personally. if there's an adversarial atmosphere shall we say or ambience or environment then it's just going to make it harder and not to say yeah there are those deadbeats that will lie cheat and steal of course you know um uh, yeah, I mean, I I can name quite a few situations where that's happened, but and I was always the one that got left usually with having to chase the money to or the car. So, uh, but I still think that um, there isn't a reason there to be adversarial in a better environment with customer experience. If it's focused on that, at least you can, at least it's a, a an environment that you can feel happy about when you go to work and uh, instead of it being adversarial and yeah, there's going to be those that are going to, you know, be uh, not tell the truth or whatever it is, but uh, take advantage and take, try to take advantage. Exactly. But you know, if you're on, on your game and your, ex your customer experience has is what it should be your pr process, then, you know, then it, it'll either, you know, they'll either buy a car or they won't, and then you'll at least be... And the deals you make are going to be the good deals that that business is the business that you want, because that's yeah. going to help grow business. That's going to, you know, bring you your referrals. That's going to bring you continued business. And and the folks that you do help get into a vehicle that maybe isn't their dream car, but it's something that gets them to yeah. work and back and gets the yeah. kids to school while they're rebuilding, and they come back and see you in 12 months, they're going to be sincerely appreciative that you helped give them that leg up and reestablish. And now let's talk about your dream car. Let's get you into that, you know, decked out F-150 that you hoped for and you didn't necessarily want the the car you've been driving the last year and a half, you know, but you're reestablished now and life is better and let's, you know, help you grow, so. Well, uh, and, and to talk about subprime, you know, I've, you know, special finance was uh, pretty prevalent in, I would say in the early late eighties, early nineties. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, I worked in Glendale at the time and uh, my husband had, was in uh, the, he was the finance director and they had a special finance department. <laughs> I've been involved in quite a few special finance departments, but that particular one. And it was, it's, it's a whole other business that you, if you're going to try to do it, you have to dedicate resources to, or you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a whole different world, right? You're really selling, you're not really selling the car, you're selling the loan. Uh, to the to the customer and um, but it's not but you can make money you can make pretty decent profits from from subprime and uh, special finance departments but yeah that's how I got to be the small claims queen because Glendale would only let five cases per day and I would go like every day uh, during the week just to collect on bad checks and yeah and I, I did pretty good. We collected most of them, but yeah. There's some interesting times coming, you know, and, you know, between all the pressures that are forcing the industry in a certain direction, you know, there's still, it is today, Acura introduced their first uh, EV. You know, everyone now seems to have EVs and sales of EVs have dropped off drastically. So the, the manufacturers are pushing them people aren't buying them and we know in, in just because of history what happens when there's a lot of something and dealers you know can't move them it's just a matter of time before we start seeing big rebates incentives you know all kinds of reasons to get these vehicles moving but we still don't have infrastructure you know Jim Farley the CEO of, of Ford is you know posting the the progress he's he's making a road trip in a lightning um he says so he can see kind of get the experience of the customers of Ford what they go through and he's pulled into a couple of charging stations that weren't working what is and now that? he's you know and he keeps saying well this is why we've joined up with you know the the Tesla supercharger network <laughs> but it it's not effective today you know Ford customers aren't just pulling into the superchargers today there's still a lot of inactive you know disrepaired just junked out chargers that are across the country. So, you know, there's there's just all these interesting side stories and all this drama in automotive inventory starting to creep in, but it's it's harder to sell these cars. So what's the what's the solution as we come into Labor Day? It's gonna be an interesting time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, incentives are coming. I also think there's probably gonna be an opportunity for leasing if the banks um, there's got to be something because cars aren't affordable the car you know what surprises me you and i talk about leasing but here in california leasing is almost it's like a non-existent yeah Every and it, it, in it, the it, midwest oh. and like I, I was a couple weeks ago i was working with a dealer in michigan and their numbers were like staggeringly opposite 70 percent plus of their vehicles are leased oh, okay here in california that's like oh. if I went to a dealership right now and said, you know, I know of a dealership that's leasing 70, they would call me a liar. It's just not happening. No, that doesn't happen. A part of it's the mileage here in California. We you know, drive a lot more, but I, I've never really been able to wrap my head around it. We always used to say, pitch everybody of purchase and a lease and, you know, show them. But here in California, leasing just isn't as strong as it is in, in different well, parts. Well, the reason, of here's why. Okay. So it, it, leasing used to be a big deal here. Uh, but uh, what happened was interest rates went so far down and the banks started increasing the rates that leases were at. And so depending on the model, for instance, okay, I could give you an example, uh, a lease on a BMW 3 Series was 400 a month. Uh, and then, uh, but you, if you were selling Volvos, uh, a car that was comparable, it was a convertible Volvo and the lease payment was 700. So depending on whatever, depending on the, the brand, there were, you know, uh, deals on leases and, and that's all governed by the banks and of course the factory. So, but all of that kind of shifted when the interest rates kept being so low and the payments were getting higher on leases and lower on contracts. And so why would you buy, you know, 
well, the payment, if the payment was the driver, right? So, but now you you look at leases and the lease payments are ridiculous. You know, one can afford those. I mean, they can afford, can't afford hardly the contract now. And so now the increase in the interest rate is gonna, I think that the banks are probably gonna start doing some kind of leasing situation. They're gonna have to do something to keep cars on the road because people can't afford. I just had a friend, she has a Lexus, she uh, is off lease. Uh, she does lease and she went, her, her lease was like some, I forget what amount, but she went in and uh, what they could offer her was a Toyota. Uh, and it was the, a double, the payment, double, double. Um, that's not going to work. Right. So she left, she actually left and she is a Toyota person through, through, through and through Toyota or Lexus. And she is right now driving a Mazda. So there's always somebody to come in and take the spot where you were. So I just feel like there's going to be, uh, the banks are going to figure out and the factories are going to figure out how they're going to be able to get people in vehicles with this. I think what you said is right. They're going to have to do something. What yeah. that something is remains to be seen. But I It'll think be it's incentives be and some kind of, some kind of subvented assisted financing, some, some kind of something. Cause there's just people, it hasn't happened yet because uh, I just read yesterday that was it Cox. They had they said that um, yeah, it was Jonathan Smoke with Cox. He said that uh, car sales are doing well; they're doing okay. So I don't know if that's global or national, I guess, but not. I don't know how that. I don't know what so Southern California is, but it might be different. It might be a little slower here than it always hits us first. Automotive always has been is you know resilient. They, they we've gotten through tough times before we'll get through these interesting times uh, there's a lot of people over the last three years that were coming into the end of their lease that you know the manufacturers didn't have product to give them so they've right. extended leases they've you know been really flexible about how they've kept cars on the road until cars were available so that's going to be uh it's interesting it's, it's 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 fun to watch you know it's just kind of a hobby just to stand on the outside and watch all these things happening and talking to dealers and talking to to people and seeing you know how they're they're existing how they're they're pivoting and, and making things work yeah yep we'll see mm -hmm. it ain't going anywhere people still need cars that's right believe me i spent uh four days commuting back and forth between my house in riverside and uh sherman oaks so i got to to see up close and personally how many people are driving and the one thing all those cars shared is they're all wearing out uh how did you go 210 uh yeah yeah and how many miles do you think it is like 80 maybe it's 81.2 miles because i just submitted my miles oh. for uh to get reimbursed and the average commute time in the morning was two and a half hours <laughs> i'm not the average lying, really. commute time to get home was three hours uh -huh. and because i was the only one here in california everybody else flew in and everybody was like you're an idiot i'm like yeah i am but i'll do anything to sleep in my own bed at night i just oh I don't like yeah sleeping in the hotel i don't like not being you know with my wife i just you know if if, if i gotta do it i gotta do it it didn't mean it was easy don't get me wrong i wasn't enjoying it no. <laughs> but it was uh it was quite the commute i did stay over on um sunday night because i had to be at the dealership at 6 a.m um, then in the morning when service started rolling in to get them up and ready so when customers showed up they would be ready to serve them so that would have been stupid but yeah i commuted every other day and that's you know that's not even the what's so so 210 to uh not to be like the californians but the 210 to the 134 is that how the 134 you, yep. the 101 to the 101 and that that's uh you know that the 210 is not the worst to the 405 <laughs> yeah the 210 isn't the worst of the freeways in southern california it's it's bad but it's not it's not oh it's not the, it's not the worst by any stretch but that 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 distance going through pasadena is is just it's a parking lot but like i said you know it's it's interesting because i say the same thing that you know when i first got into sales right i was a technician at a, a dealership a ford and azusa store i was a tune-up tech i was making great money i was the highest paid guy in the shop i'm young i'm making more money than anybody else i'm loving life and um 
the sales manager that, that convinced me to go into sales, uh, we actually parked up off the 10 freeway in, in Colton one day. And he said, just watch that freeway for five minutes. Just watch. And I was like, okay. He goes, what do all those cars have in common right now? And I'm like, well, they all have tires. They all have windows. They all, you know, they all have, and he's like, they're all wearing out, dude. Every time you turn that key, that car is wearing out. doesn't matter how nice the car is, how expensive it is. It's wearing out in some way. In other words, there's never going to be a time when everyone's got a new car and the market's saturated. No one else needs a car. He goes, now take it a step further. Right now, driving down that freeway, somebody's going to get a call from their wife saying, hey, I'm, we're pregnant. We're going to have a kid. So that little two-door Civic coupe that they have isn't going to work anymore. Someone's going to be in an accident today. It sucks, but someone's going to, it could be a fender bender, but someone's going to need to replace their car. Someone's going to have an engine fail. You know, he just named all these things. And I was like, yeah, I get it. I get it. The car business is never going to go away. As long as people are dependent on transportation in their cars, because at least here in California, we don't have any type of public transportation that could take the place of cars and if you do take public transit you take your life in your hands most of the time. yes that's what i'm saying it's not going to there's always going to be a need for cars and the people to sell them so we are in i won't say a protected industry but an industry with no end in sight at least yeah but i do think that that there's because there's so much disruption and some of it's just stupid disruption that isn't going to matter too much but there's the fact remains that nobody wants to feel like we were talking earlier. Nobody wants to have an adversarial situation when they're spending a lot of money on something and they want to feel like they are, they can have some trust and they just, nobody wants that. And so what's driving that they, they get these great experiences, other places, and they just want that from when they go to buy a car and whatever that looks like, you know, I think there's just a huge pressure right now on, on the way that the, industry and the way that the retail is set up and uh, we'll just have to see how it all comes comes down but yeah it's going to be interesting I, and i think you're right i think consumers are going to drive that the, the automotive industry has been really good at not caving to pressure from consumers <laughs> yeah. for a hundred years they're like we've this is how we're going to do it for people buy cars the way we want to sell them but i think there's a shift and we're in it right now and yeah. we're finally starting to see some some progress being made towards providing a better experience. Yeah. It's just better. It's just better to do that. Yeah. I agree. All right. As we wind down, let's shift it up a little bit. What else, uh, what outside of automotive is uh, on your playlist or on your, on your, on your head this week? Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that the show on Netflix, Painkiller, is fantastic. Painkiller. Yes. Okay. It's about the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma and the opioid oh. crisis. Yes, Matthew Got Broderick it. is plays Richard Sackler very well, and you know, there's this that that movie Dope Sick. If anybody watched Dope Sick on on um, Hulu. It's that was a very good movie, but this it's the same subject matter, but this is Peter Berg is directing it and he's there's a little bit of a dark humor about parts of it. Uh that's very interesting. But yeah, so highly recommend it. Um that's I think all I have for now. I probably have more, but what did you have to share? Uh, uh, we have a, a birthday I want to recognize on that kind of had uh, some impact for both of us early on. Mm -hmm. I'll let you share who it is. <laughs> it's it's uh, my girl, Belinda Carlisle. She's uh, from the Go-Go's, as probably everyone knows, but. Hopefully everyone knows. If they're listening to us, then they probably know, right? Yeah. By now. Yeah. The Go-Go's mm -hmm. were just hugely influential in the LA music uh, scene. And, and we've talked, Kathy and I, for, I mean, many episodes about how I'm sure it's it's similar to other cities in this fact is, you know, there's a, just an, an innate internal culture in the, in the city. I know Atlanta has a thriving music scene, you know, 
Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. But there was something unique about the LA bar scene. And, and, and when I say bar, I don't mean just like bar, there's clubs, you know, little clubs that there's probably, at one time, there was probably two dozen places where you could go see these acts. So it wasn't like going to a concert. It was just going out on a Wednesday or Thursday night and seeing these bands and following them. And the Go-Go's were in that mix. Yeah, They were always playing someplace. It just seemed like if you wanted to see music, you could see the Go-Go's at any given time and and watching them early on from a raw, not, I, I never could say that they were punk, but they sure weren't pop initially. You know, they yeah. had a, they had a rawness to them. They had an energy. They had just a, uh, just a fun environment that they brought with them and, and, they, they changed the, the industry. They really did. They changed music. So happy birthday to Belinda Carlisle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw the Go-Go's at the, uh, uh, many places, but at the San Clemente, like, community center. Yeah. yeah. My, and today's my... also uh, a recognition of one of my favorite albums. And it wasn't necessarily a compilation of anything new weirdly enough it was a collection of singles and b-sides but on this date nobody can see this i know it's a podcast but i'm going to hold it up anyways just because i want to and it's our show so fuck it um <laughs> this is a placard that i got from a friend that worked at tower records back in the day when new albums would come out they'd send out all kinds of promotional stuff and uh, when new orders substance came out uh, i went to tower and i was chilling with her and i was like dude i gotta get those and she's like no we can't you know, give those out and stuff. And I knew it was the only time I'd ever asked her for anything, but she was always coming up with cool promo stuff and giving it out. So I ended up getting them and I've had them since 1987. I've kept them with me from them. New Order Substance was just such a huge, huge album for me that even to this day, there are songs that I hear off the album, like Shell Shock, Shell Shock. When I hear that song and it ends, I automatically think State of the Nation is coming on next. And it almost like is weird when, you know, because if it's on the radio, obviously something else will come on. But I just anticipate state of the, the intro to State of the Nation because that's the order that I heard it again and again and again so many times for so many years. One of my favorite albums of all time, if you can't tell. And so just to be more clear, because I have a feeling and some people listening to this might not even realize there's a band called New, New Order. Oh, that's true, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, which was born out of Joy Division, and when Ian Curtis committed suicide, New Order was the band after, and they made a really big success of things, and they're still they're still going around separately, not not together anymore. But um, yeah, but uh, still and one of those bands that truly had an impact. We talk about Gogos having an impact on music. You know, New Order changed the direction of music electronically in so many ways. There are hip hop artists today that have been influenced um, by New Order. Mm -hmm. There are so many acts that that uh, were affected by the way they changed things. It's it's impossible to really truly measure their impact on music as a whole. And like you said, they're kind of doing their own things now. Um, you mentioned earlier before we even got on a phrase that's very common in so many different areas. You can have too much of a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. It seemed like we got to a level that it was inevitable that they separate and go their separate ways. You know, so many, so many great bands just got to a peak and then fractioned off into going different directions, New Order being one of them. But on this day in 1987, also notable that year, a couple months before this record came out in June, I graduated high school. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is, that's pretty memorable, I would say. For me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been, uh, I cleared all my history on YouTube because I just thought, what the heck, let's, let's see what happens. And it hasn't been a very great experience. I have to tell you, I just, I don't know why. I just thought, let's see what happens. I'm always willing to test things. And um, so for some reason I'm getting like, 60s and 70s uh bands I think mainly probably because I was listening to a lot of Emerson Lake and Palmer mm. 
and uh, looking at their old stuff. And you reminded me because you were talking about how they split up and came back and, or didn't come back, but split up and then are doing their own thing, but they did. And then, but they came back together for a concert um, and they always stayed friends. And now um, two of the, two of the three of them are, are passed away. But so I've been getting served up like, um, uh, like, uh, like the grassroots, Do you, the, a band called the grassroots from like, I want to say like 1969 or something. And then, so there's videos about like, whatever happened to the grassroots. And so I, <laughs> I particularly, you know, I like documentaries. So tell me a story about your, sure. that's what I really like the best. I like to read memoirs. I like, uh, I like, I like documentaries about people and like how they, I don't know how they overcame obstacles and things. Sure. So, yeah. I love a backstory too. Yeah. But yeah, it turns out the grassroots, um, the guy that I always like what I did know of them, there was a guy that sang lead for them. And some people who are fans of the office will know that Creed from the office was in the grassroots. Yeah. Really? Yes. But I guess he left. Oh, wow. I know, right? And so I guess he left in 1969. And so it turns out the guy that I thought was the lead singer, who was lead singer, um, but prior to that, he was not always the lead singer. He didn't like, you know how bands like start because they just come together and, and make a band? Like Joy Division did, right? Um, the Grassroots was like a different band completely. And then two guys bowed out and here came the guy that sang all their hits. Sure. That happens a lot. Yeah. Dudes and Creed. And and then that's it's but so it's interesting to see that uh like how different bands evolve and um I just yeah, I think it's interesting that, that it, thank God YouTube has all this stuff to be able to see it and and uh, I get lost on those rabbit holes all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's easy to, to do. Yeah, it makes and then, it you know, I'll, to I'll something that brings up a memory and then I'll be in that mood for you know a yeah. whole day yeah yeah it happened uh Tuesday actually uh I just happened on my playlist I I had a, a song come up bow wow wow um and it just put me in the mood and I remembered you know talking about band creation right Malcolm McLaren is on vacation in Sri Lanka sees a girl singing on the corner for you know donations and stuff thinks she's amazing talks to her parents or her mom, basically gets the mom to sign her over to Malcolm McLaren on the promise he's going to make her a that star. Doesn't and sound good. <laughs> brings her to England. He's, he's you know, Malcolm McLaren, a lot of people think he's a genius and maybe he was, but and I just- Most like, people don't know who he is. So you should probably explain. He's, he's an English um, promoter, uh, producer, very famous and in being instrumental in basically anyone that came out of England in the late 70s and the early 80s, him and uh, Vivian uh, Westwood, Westwood, Vivian Westwood, basically created the punk scene um, and dressed all the punks, right? Uh, but he took a look at one of the acts that he was promoting, Adam and the Ants, and he basically said, Adam, beat it. And he took his ants and he gave them to Annabella the Wynn and created Bow Wow Wow. And one of the reasons I've always liked Adam and the Ants, or Adam, Adam Ant, is because rather than just kind of, you know, go home and, and cry in a soup, he said, all right, you know, I see what you did there. I'm going to come back even stronger and better. And he did. He came back with friend or foe after that. Here, Malcolm McLaren thought he was going to make Bow Wow Wow the next big thing. And they never really turned into the next big thing. But at one point, Adam Ant was freaking giant. I mean, he was king of the whole world. Everybody knew who Adam and the Ants were, but nobody knew who Bow Wow Wow was. So, but it, like I said, just those those rabbit holes you can go down and and with YouTube are just fascinating sometimes. And I remember now why I cleared my history because uh, one because I wanted to see what happened, but uh, I just watched Alex Winter. He he's from Bill and Ted. Alex Winter. He yeah yeah he played Bill Bill Preston. Uh, he is a director. Uh, he does a lot of documentaries and he just released a documentary called the YouTube effect and it's really good and it's scary, but it's very good. So I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, it's everywhere. He's got it. You can go on Amazon prime and get it. The YouTube effect. The YouTube effect. Yes. It's, it's uh, disturbing, but it's good, good information for everyone. And 
there you go. So now that one will be on my list. That sounds interesting. Yeah. And then while I'm at it, while I think about it, is uh, there is a Netflix documentary on this guy, Mark Cavendish, and he is a uh, he, he's a bike rider. I don't know what you would call it, a, a professional, like a Lance Armstrong type, but oh, okay. but all, like the antithesis of, of Armstrong. He's this guy's really honest and awesome. And it's a story of his uh rise and then he has this this like terrible thing happen to him and then he rises again and it's all around the tour de france and some other and he's he's british i no, i think he's uh, he might be irish I, maybe he's irish uh, but his yeah mark cavendish is and it's called never enough mark cavendish never enough it's on netflix and um you'll cry and it's really good i love a good triumph over tragedy story oh totally it's like crazy good yeah awesome yeah. Well, fantastic. So we got three good recommendations to wrap up with and a happy birthday. So I think we're, we're yeah, good. I think we're good. Yeah. Awesome. Again, thank you. Anyone that's paid attention to us this long. We hope that you've uh, gotten some good stuff out of it. We hope you laughed. We hope you learned and we hope you come back and see us again. Yeah. And if you want to sign up for my newsletter, I will put the link in the show notes, but you could go to my Cruise Control Inc. website, and there's a tab for VIP, and you can sign up there. I highly recommend. Yes, I would love it. So awesome. All right. So that's it for this week, and we will definitely see you next week. Have a good week. Bye for now.